to uh, introduce Professor Thomas Hales. Uh, he's really, you know, probably uh, the reason we are here, uh, his uh, name is synonymous with uh, big proof. And uh, I think uh, going forward, uh, his vision will be, you know, I think guiding us quite a bit. Uh, so uh, Professor Hales uh, graduated from Princeton in 1986. He's the Andrew Mellon professor uh, at uh, University of Pittsburgh. Uh, you know, he's solved many open problems, uh, significant open problems, including the Kepler conjecture, the uh, honeycomb conjecture. Uh, these have been, you know, some of these have been open, I think, for a very long time, and uh, in like centuries. The um, thing that he came out of it with is the, the need to actually uh, computer verify these proofs. And uh, he launched the FlySpec project, which, uh, you know, uh, they uh, uh, completed this thing successfully and of uh, Publish the results, and uh, I'm looking forward to uh, hearing about big proof uh, from Dr. Hayes. Thank you. Um, it's my great pleasure to be here today. Um, it's been a number of years since I was uh, at Cambridge. I was a student here. Uh, for part three tripos in the 1980s. And uh, I'd like to just pay tribute to two of the professors I had here. Uh, this is uh, John Conway on the left, uh, who's well known for his work in the theory of sphere packings and finite simple groups. Uh, and so it was from a course here in Cambridge that I first learned about the Kepler conjecture on October 22nd, 1982. Uh, on the right, I've picked another professor who may be uh, familiar to this group. Uh, this is uh, John Thompson, uh, who of course uh, was one of the authors of the uh, fight thompson odd order theorem, uh, which was formalized by Georges Gontier. Uh, so the course I took from him was actually modular forms, not group theory. He was, uh, he and Conway were both interested in a, a subject uh, called moonshine in those days, and modular forms is a significant part of that. Uh, so I want to go back and talk about, uh, I want to talk about some conjectures today. I'm not going to solve any of those conjectures, so I hope Nobody is too disappointed, but um, uh, the first conjecture that I'll talk about is uh, one that comes up in sphere packings that I've been involved with for a no number of years. So this is the Kepler conjecture. So this has a very, uh, this is a very simple question to ask. What is the densest arrangement of congruent balls in three-dimensional space? And uh, Kepler proposed an answer. It's the face-centered cubic packing, or if you want the uh, familiar cannonball arrangement, just you, you put the balls in a pyramid. Uh, so you just make layers like this and then fill in the holes in the next layer going as deeply as possible. Uh, so that was the conjecture I learned about from Conway. Um, I want to go back and talk a little bit about the early history uh, so, uh, Buckminster Fuller actually claimed to have a proof of the Kepler conjecture back in the 1970s. Uh, he's an architect well known for uh, the geodesic dome, uh, and uh, his claim was just nonsense, uh, but uh, it was sort of out there that people knew how to solve this conjecture. Uh, in the 1990s, uh, when I was uh, first getting involved in the conjecture, um, uh, a professor at Berkeley, uh, this was a, a senior tenured professor at Berkeley, claimed to have a solution to the Kepler conjecture. Um, and I thought that this proof was nonsense as well. Um, after the paper was published, um, 
I wrote a paper in rebuttal giving a series of counterexamples uh, to this paper and uh, published it in the uh, Mathematical Intelligencer. Um, as, and, and then this is, uh, so that was in 1994. And about the same time, the Mathematical Intelligencer started uh, running this advertisement. So they, they made a brochure um, saying, we're not afraid of controversy. We welcome it. Um, uh, if some of you know Chandler Davis, who was then the chief editor, um, you know, he's uh, very well qualified to make the claim that we're not afraid of controversy. Uh, and if you open up this brochure, um, what you find is the Kepler conjecture controversy. Um, and uh, it says perhaps the most controversial topic to be covered in the mathematical intelligencer is the Kepler conjecture. Uh, in the mathematical intelligencer, Thomas C. Hales takes on Wu Yisheng's 1990 announcement that he had proved the Kepler conjecture. And then uh, it um, quotes about a page of my article in that advertisement. Um, so we had a very public and disagreeable debate about uh, this claimed proof. Uh, in the end, my counterexamples uh, uh, were convincing enough that uh, this uh, earlier proof was rejected, but uh, it was against this backdrop that Sam Ferguson and I were working on our own proof of the Kepler conjecture. And it's uh, this particular history of controversy that had us quite worried uh, when it came time for us to make an announcement of the proof. Um, there was no way to make an announcement of this quietly. And uh, nobody had um, checked our proof uh, when we made the announcement. And of course, I w was hoping for a very speedy resolution of this issue because I, I didn't want to be left um, you know, in the midst of another controversy. Uh, so things did not work out as I had hoped. Um, four years into the refereeing process. And so uh, it was actually just about a month ago that uh, the formal proof of the Kepler conjecture was finally published. And uh, because of that, I was going back over some of the old papers, and I pulled up this uh, referee report that came to me four years into the process. Um, this referee had divided the proof into uh, three phases. The first phase was sort of the mathematical part, and the second two phases were the computer part, sort of generating the cases and then using computers to rule out uh, the possible counterexamples. And um, the referee goes through various hypothetical scenarios, uh, including the possibility that the theory would collapse in its present form. Um, and then uh, the referee says, with all this in mind, one would prefer to have phase two and phase three, the computer parts of the proof, checked prior to start working on phase one and minimize the chance that the essential work of careful reading of the manuscript <coughs> might prove useless. Uh, so at this point, I became extremely frustrated. Uh, first of all, the re reviewer is revealing that the work had not started yet after four years. <laughs> <laughs> Second, that the computer parts of the proof had to be checked first. And finally, that they had no plans of starting the review of the mathematical parts until the computer proofs had been checked. So um, it was about six months after I received this report that I announced the start of the Flyspec project. 
uh, to give a formalization. Uh, and the long-term goal is really to just completely eliminate referees <laughs> from <laughs> the process. <laughs> Uh, so, by contrast, uh, once, so this is maybe about a year later, uh, Gertrude Bauer, working under Tobias Nipko, uh, started the formalization project. And they didn't, so this is still when the paper had not been published. Um, and they weren't trying to do the full formalization, but they just picked one part of the proof. Uh, Dealing to do, uh, dealing with uh, planar graphs, and uh, made it uh, their task to do the formalization of this one piece of the proof. And this is what I would have liked to have received uh, from the traditional referees. Uh, Gertrude Bauer writes to me saying, "I have completed the translation of your Java program in into an executable Isabel specification." and tested it against the graphs generated with your program. A proof of the correctness of my Isabel specification will also prove the correctness of the Java program. Furthermore, the generated graphs can be used for the other parts of the proof. Now, I started with the verification. Could you please help me with some questions about the algorithm? And I get uh, very pointed, uh, detailed questions about that part of the proof. So a few lessons from this early part of the formalization of the Kepler conjecture. First of all, do not be afraid of controversy. Uh, don't seek it out, but uh, when it comes, don't be afraid of it. Formalization of partial results is useful. Uh, so uh, the lesson I see is that formalizers, formalizers should be part of what you might call tactical response teams <laughs> that routinely intervene in prominent difficult, unpublished proofs. So I think there's a tendency uh, for some people to pick uh, mathematical gems, uh, things that have been worked over time and time again until uh, you have a very beautiful proof and then those get formalized. Uh, but what was very valuable in this case was uh, for people in this community to get involved before the paper was published and to pick out some piece that was manageable and, and to treat that and to help move things forward. So we all have our favorite examples that we can cite of uh, prominent proofs that take a long time for verification, like the ABC conjecture now is, uh, I believe, in the fifth year of review at this point. Uh, the Poincaré conjecture took three years to review. Uh, Hiranaka's announcement of uh, resolution of singularities and positive characteristics. Maybe this is more doubtful, uh, but uh, there's been no official statement about that. Uh, in cryptography, there's sort of ongoing battles. I mentioned just one of them, the uh, hash method authentication code brawl uh, that uh, could uh, use some intervention from this community. Um, while I'm still on the subject of sphere packings, uh, the sphere packing problem has now been uh, solved in dimensions 2, 3, 8, and 24. Um, the solution in dimension 8 came last year. Uh, it's really quite a spectacular proof by Marina Viazowska, pictured here on the right. Uh, she did this by solving a conjecture of Cohn and Elkies. Uh, so this is Henry Cohn standing with Marina. Uh, so in the three-dimensional proof, there are many uh, linear programming certificates that get verified. In the eight-dimensional proof, there's a single global linear programming certificate uh, that gives the proof. It's a very complicated uh, certificate that needs to be described using modular forms, but it's just a single certificate, that linear programming certificate that needs verification. 
So I think this would be a nice, uh, you know, we finished three, what's next? Uh, next is eight. Um, so it, it would build some nice libraries as well. It involves uh, uh, Fourier analysis, Schwartz functions, Laplace transform, modular forms, quasi-modular forms, and there's also a little bit of uh, computer-assisted verification using interval arithmetic. So uh, now I'm going to uh, turn to some other conjectures. Uh, my second example uh, is something that I haven't worked on, but it's part of uh, Hilbert's 18th problem. So Hilbert's 18th problem has three parts. The first part was uh, solved by Bieberbach. The third part is uh, sphere packings and relating pack related packing problems. And then there's the second part of uh, Hilbert's 18th problem that I want to talk about briefly now. Uh, so this is the question of anisohedral tiles. Uh, so it's best illustrated with a picture. So we all know that squares give a tiling of the plane. And there are ways to do it, like on the right, has complete symmetry, uh, but on the left, it doesn't have complete symmetry. We have fault lines. Uh, so you can't ask whether every tiling of the squares has complete symmetry, because there are other ways to do it. But Hilbert asked, the question is basically whether this picture works in general. So you take some tile with which you can form a, a tiling. Can you, can you rearrange the pieces somehow so that it looks like what you have on the right, in the sense that you have a symmetry taking any tile to any other tile? So this is Hilbert's. Uh, so Hilbert liked asking these uh, simple questions that were difficult to answer. Um, and uh, so a counterexample was found, an anisohedral tile was found by Reinhardt in 1928. And um, Reinhardt, you can tell, really had a mission from the time he was a graduate student to solve this problem. He was uh, Hilbert's mathematical assistant for a while when he was a graduate student. His advisor was Bieberbach, who solved the first part of Hilbert's problem. And in his thesis, the problem that he tries to solve is just in the plane, can you, let's classify all the uh, convex polygonal tiles and check whether uh, they work, okay, whether uh, they're anisohedral or not. Um, and in his thesis, he found, well, the, the Hexagons are easy. There are three families. Triangles always tile, so that's easy. Quadrilaterals always tile, so that's easy. But then he ran, it, ran into trouble with pentagon, convex pentagon tilings. And in his thesis, he found five families, but he wasn't able to show that there were no other possibilities. Uh, so this uh, then became the classification problem related to second part of Hilbert's problem is to find all of the convex pentagon tiles. <coughs> uh, so nothing more happened after Reinhardt for uh, 50 years, till 1968. Uh, Kirshner uh, found three more families of tiles. And uh, this became popularized by Martin Gardner in Scientific American. Uh, so Kirshner said, wrote that he had a proof that the list is complete, but he said it's compl extremely laborious and will be given elsewhere. Okay, famous last <laughs> words. <laughs> um, his classification became wid widely known. And as a result, uh, people started working on tiling problems. And uh, what do you know, more examples started cropping up, uh, including, so this is a tiling that appears at the headquarters of the Math Association of America. 
it's one of the tilings that doesn't appear in the classification. Uh, and over time, more and more counterexamples were found to uh, Kirshner's classification. Uh, so in summary, not only was, was Kirshner's proof incorrect, but the classification that he was trying to prove was entirely false. Um, so as of a couple of years ago, there were uh, 14 uh, tilings that had been found, and these are all families. So some of these you can uh, do some deformations and uh, they will still tile. Uh, and then the classification was announced earlier this year. And what do you know? This was a computer assisted proof. Uh, this is done by, uh, was done by Michael Rao. Uh, the proof is about 5,000 lines of C++. Um, and if you look at the slides that he gives, he suggests that it might be a good idea of making a formal proof of this result in Coq or similar software. Uh, so uh, he's reaching out to this group, and I suggest this is a nice problem. I think a lot of the uh, uh, structures developed by Gontier for the uh, four color theorems, such as uh, hypermaps, uh, uh, should be just exactly uh, what you need to uh, carry this out formally. Uh, so part of this talk is inspired by a book uh, that many of you are familiar with, uh, Imre Lakatos's book, uh, Proofs and Refutations. This book came out in the 1970s. Um, when I was a freshman undergraduate, I carried this book with me everywhere I went. It and uh, Polya's How to Solve It sort of were my, my guides about uh, how to do uh, research. Uh, so Lakatosha's book talks about this uh, dialectical process of making conjectures and finding refutations to those conjectures, going back and forth in a way that makes uh, the growth of mathematics possible. Uh, so. Uh, I think uh, this example of convex tilings fits into that. First, uh, I conjecture, then a claim classification, then counter examples to that, and now, again, an unpublished uh, uh, computer-assisted proof of the result. Uh, the next uh, uh, conjectures that I want to talk about, uh, so again, the honeycomb problem is one that I was involved in directly and the Kelvin conjectures. So the honeycomb problem is a very easy uh, question to ask. Uh, you want to partition the plane into cells of equal area, and you want to do it in the optimal way. And by optimal, you mean that the average perimeter should be as small as possible. Uh, so this is a very old problem. Uh, Varro, this is in, what, 36 BC, wrote a book on agriculture. Uh, he discusses the uh, bee's honeycomb and says that there are two competing theories about why the honeycomb has six sides. One of the theories was uh, bees have six feet, and the other was, uh, he says, that uh, do not the chamber and the comb have six angles. The geometricians prove that hexagon inscribed in a circular figure encloses the greatest amount of space. So this is the isoparametric property of the honeycomb. So I gave a proof of this in 1999. And then you can ask exactly the same question in three dimensions. Now again, you want to partition space into cells of equal volume. And you want to do it in such a way that now the surface area, on average, is as small as possible. Uh, so this has become known as the Kelvin problem, uh, who first uh, worked on the problem and proposed an answer. 
Um, so by isoparametric properties, you want uh, cells that are fairly round, but if you make them into spheres to minimize the surface area for the given volume, then you can't pack them together, and so you need some compromise. And uh, uh, maybe you can see the, the cells that he proposed. So they look uh, very much like uh, truncated octahedra. And let me just show you, uh, with truncated octahedra, uh, uh, tiling with them, you, you, you can't go wrong. You, you just put hexagon against hexagon and square against square, and they tile. So, uh, and they're fairly round, so this is a natural conjecture. But uh, Kelvin realized that this couldn't possibly be the answer. And the reason uh, goes back to experiments performed by uh, Plateau in 1849 with soap bubbles. Uh, you see here uh, some soap bubbles, and the surfaces are surfaces of constant mean curvature. Uh, when the um, surfaces come together, they always come together in threes and the angles are always 120 degrees. And when the edges come together, the edges always come together in fours, and they always form tetrahedral angles. So these are the observations of Plateau. And Kelvin's uh, truncated octahedra don't satisfy these properties, so it can't possibly be uh, the answer. But his uh, suggested solution was just to warp the truncated octahedra slightly and it's only a slight warping that's necessary so that uh, you precisely satisfy Plateau's conditions. And this became the Kelvin conjecture. Uh, so how did Kelvin uh, describe this uh, mathematically? He says, it is shown beautifully and illustrated with great perfection by making a skeleton model of 36 wires or wire arcs for the 36 edges of the complete figure and dipping it in soap solution to fill the faces with film, which is easily done for all the faces but one. The curvature of the hexagonal film on the two sides of the plane of its six long diagonals is beautifully shown by reflected light. So if we are to state the Kelvin conjecture, we have to make precise mathematical sense of what is meant by the Kelvin foam. And as it turned out, nobody was able to give a precise description of the Kelvin foam in a mathematical sense uh, until the 1990s. Um, and so what we had was not really a conjecture, but a conjectured conjecture, uh, something that we, if we could make it precise, then we would have uh, the conjecture. Um, so uh, the proof of Plateau's conditions came in 1976 with Gene Taylor. Um, uh, the proof of the existence of this Kelvin foam has uh, never been published. Unfortunately, Fred Almgren passed away uh, the year after uh, the announcement was made that a precise description could be made. In the meantime, in 1993, a counterexample was found to the Kelvin conjecture. Uh, this is the Weir Phelan foam. Uh, we might ask, in what sense is this a counterexample if the conjecture itself was only a conjectured conjecture? <laughs> and so, it's really just a conjectured counterexample. <laughs> um, not just because it was impossible to state the Kelvin conjecture precisely, but also because the counterexample was constructed by numerical simulations on a computer. And there is no, it's still to this day, there is no rigorous proof of the existence of this counterexample. 
so uh, this slide just uh, it, it's a little hard to imagine what this where phelan foam looks like. I like to uh, imagine it um, as formed by uh, a system of tubing, as you see here. Uh, there are holes in which you can drop dodecahedra, uh, and uh, if, then if you slice the tubes into sections and make uh, each of those sections into a bubble and then sort of stretch them out until all the empty space is filled in, then you get exactly this counterexample to the Kelvin conjecture. Uh, I uh, was just walking before this talk and there's a sculpture called Genesis out in front of the Newton Institute by Robinson and it has interlinking rings that uh, are exactly uh, the structure that you see in the uh, Ware Phelan foam. Uh, so, this was used, for instance, in the design of the National Aquatics Center. This is the, count, the, the counter example to the Kelvin conjecture. Um, so, the lesson is uh, do not assume that major conjectures are actually conjectures. And uh, I've been uh, corresponding with uh, uh, some of these. Uh, people, Frank Morgan, uh, Rob Kushner, John Sullivan, to try to state the conjecture in a formal way inside a proof assistant. Um, so uh, what I'm thinking about now, and this is not an original uh, suggestion by any means, but uh, uh, I'm thinking about uh, a formal abstract project that I uh, first brought up in the joint meetings in January 2016. Um, there's a big initiative in the mathematics uh, community right now uh, to make a bigger use of uh, formal methods uh, to move things in the direction of digitiz digitization. And uh, the point uh, that I think all of us make is that if we promote sloppy platforms, then uh, the entire world will be worse off for it. Uh, and uh, the proposal of formal abstracts is just to uh, take uh, major parts of the mathematical literature and state all the definitions in a precise way inside a proof assistant in a way that uh, can be read by ordinary mathematicians and by a computer, um, and also to give statements of main theorems in the mathematical literature. Um, so, of course, uh, this community is very well aware of the big uh, dangers in uh, writing definitions and stating theorems without actually doing uh, the proofs. Um, one example that I give here uh, with the formal proof of the Kepler conjecture, uh, some of the definitions we had to rewrite as many as 40 times before we got things just the way they needed to be to get everything uh, to work. Uh, so there will be, of course, problems uh, with this uh, project in the sense that we're not going to be able to get everything exactly right, but I think this will be a huge step forward uh, in uh, mathematics uh, to get uh, a large body of material uh, stated formally. So at the end, the solution to all these problems is just to do it anyway. Um, so just short term, uh, so this is at a very early stage. We're still just exploring things. Um, uh, my background uh, as a student of uh, Bob Langlands is in uh, automorphic representation theory and uh, p-adic groups. Uh, as a sample problem, I thought of just uh, trying to write down the clay million dollar prize problems in uh, proof assistant. And again, I stress we're, we're not solving a thing here. We're just trying to write things down in a precise way. 
Um, so uh, my background in automorphic representation theory is it's, it's one of these areas that has ambitions to swallow up the rest of mathematics. And uh, there are uh, many uh, subfields that uh, are interrelated uh, with that. So I think even trying to write down what uh, you know, we were doing and talking about when I was a graduate student would already be a, a very ambitious uh, project. Let me talk a little bit about uh, the clay prize problem, prize problems. Uh, so these, there's, there's seven problems here, and uh, we want to just write them down in a formal way. Uh, some of them are, uh, I think, quite easy to write down, even if they're hard to solve, like the, uh, the Riemann hypothesis. We just need to say what the Riemann zeta function is. And uh, of course, for instance, in whole light, we already have uh, um, the analytic proof of the prime number theorem, which uses the Riemann zeta function. And uh, John Harrison, as part of that project, already um, has the analytic continuation of the Riemann zeta function to the real part of S bigger than zero. So we have the critical strip, and we can talk about uh, the, the Riemann zeta function. So, this, uh, so that, that's very easy. Or, or the um, P versus NP, uh, if you, uh, so the official description uh, is given by Cook. And uh, I mean, he, he goes through everything in, in great detail in the official problem statement. He says what uh, uh, you need to say what a Turing machine is. You need to say what these complexity classes are. He goes through the definition of a Turing machine. And he goes through the definition of the complexity classes. So everything you need for the formalization is uh, pretty much written down there. Um, Poincaré conjecture. Uh, people have done, you need to say what a manifold is, what a three sphere is, and uh, what a contractible loop is. Uh, there's been a little bit of work, I understand, with manifolds, maybe not too much. Uh, people do have three spheres and notion of contractibility, so that part is all there. It wouldn't take much work uh, beyond what we have, just to sit down and write down uh, the formal statement of Poincaré. The same goes with Navier-Stokes. That's uh, you, you just write down the partial differential equation, and, and you have Navier-Stokes. Um, Birch, Swinnert, and Dyer might be a little. So it depends on how much you're willing to as assume there. So, so for many years, the Birch, Swinnert, and Dyer again was just a conjectural conjecture. Uh, because uh, you're using the L function of an elliptic curve and the uh, analytic continuation and functional equation of the elliptic curve were not known. Uh, but thanks to the work of uh, Wiles and uh, the follow-up work on the Taniyama conjecture, you at least have uh, the analytic continuation and functional equation. So if you're just trying to state the conjecture, you need to assume a very, very deep theorem in mathematics uh, to make sense of the question. But if you're willing to make assumptions like that, then it should be fairly uh, doable to, to write things down. Uh, Hodge conjecture, Maybe you, know, you need Durand cohomology. People have talked about cohomology theories, but maybe not Durand cohomology. Um, Yang Mills. OK, so this, <laughs> this is where we run into real trouble when we try to state things uh, formally. Um, uh, so my claim is that it probably cannot be stated formally. Um, problem sort of requires the winner to build a theory and then to prove something about that theory. And so it's not really a well-specified problem. Um, so I gave this slide once before at a talk I gave at uh, 
uh, Artificial Intelligence and Theorem Proving uh, Conference. And uh, sitting right in front of me on the front row was, I, di I didn't, hadn't met him yet, but I, I certainly met him at <laughs> right after my talk, a, a physicist who is, was responsible, if you go to the clay status of the problem by Michael Douglas. Michael Douglas was sitting right in front of me. <laughs> um, and uh, he said that he thought that a precise statement could be made. Okay, so he wasn't claiming that anybody has stated the Yang Mills problem precisely, but uh, there are physicists who claim that then it might be possible to state this precisely. So I asked just on, uh, <laughs> if you have a question, right? You, you sent it off to uh, Stack Exchange. Um, so the question is, what is the precise mathematical statement of the Yang, Mills, and Mass Gap problem? A mathematician writing a statement of each Clay Millennium Prize problems in a proof, formal proof assistant. Um, and um, the problem is just, so I've, I've quoted some of the language of the official statement of the problem. And I, I didn't pick, I didn't go out of my way to find the intentionally vague passages to quote. What I'm quoting here is the official statement of the problem. Um, and it uses phrases like in correspondence with, does that mean there's actually a bijection or some other sort of correspondence? Uh, it speaks of, it uses the word predictions three times. Are these somehow physics predictions or are these precise mathematical uh, conjectures? Um, it says, as it should agree with the predictions, as described in textbooks. Um, so, and then there are no references <laughs> to any textbooks. Uh, so my proposal to, if you want to collect a million dollars, is to write a textbook. <laughs> <laughs> and then quote it <laughs> as evidence that you've correctly solved <laughs> the problem. Um, so I got a few suggestions, nothing definite. Uh, the last uh, comment uh, was a little bit pessimistic, that Jaffe and Witten's statement of the problem is probably the most precise that you can get with our current state of knowledge. Uh, so in conclusion, um, what I'm suggesting is that we sort of move into mathematics in a bigger way, uh, uh, stating definitions, statements of conjectures, statements of theorems, um, but that this will often not be as easy as we think it might be, where we think that we have conjectures, we may find that we only have conjectures of conjectures, where we think we have theorems, uh, we may have statements that are so vague that we can't possibly formalize them. And in doing this, we will start uh, an interaction with the mathematical community that I think will uh, benefit everyone. So thank you very much. mixed uh, formality and humor in a way that was quite <laughs> unexpected. <laughs> so uh, uh, I'll, I'll open it up for questions. You know, when you uh, just raise your hand, I'll keep track of who's uh, asking questions. And please state your uh, name uh, before you ask a question. I'm Arnold Neumeyer from Vienna. Ah, uh, yes, OK. So <laughs> another expert on Young Mills. This is <laughs> on Young Mills and uh, gap is in fact a conjectural problem only <laughs> because it's really vaguely formulated. But I, be, but I believe it can be made precise. Yes. 
and uh, it's uh, all that stuff that is mentioned in textbooks is of course in physics textbook in a non in a very non rigorous way, but there is a lot of uh, mathematical physics behind in the background that uh, it's uh, I think one can make a precise statement. Yeah. What it means. Okay. So so I should say that uh, as I've explored this question, Arnold's name comes up again and again as somebody enforcing the the rigor of the Yang Mills problem. So good to have you here. So one thing that struck me is that uh, is, you know, the way you uh, uh, are going about this, it sounds like you know uh, just defining things precisely the, the, you know, could, could actually uh, create uh, new mathematics as well. Um, yeah, so this has been my experience, for instance, with my interaction with the uh, geometric measure theory crowd trying to precisely formulate the uh, Kelvin problem. Uh, we haven't written anything down precisely because, you know, as soon as you start asking these questions, uh, research questions start coming up as well. My name is Tony Hall. I suggest you need a, a theory of bubbles <laughs> in order to formalize it accurately. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So there is a theory of bubbles. Well, there's a, there's a subject of geometric measure theory deals with bubbles. So. <laughs> <laughs> I need to see some hands out there. Yeah, we have plenty of time for discussion, and uh, I think there's, uh, you know, yeah. Yeah. So I'm in the F abstract. I'm name Steve Audi. Would you like me to stand? I'm Steve Audi. Tom, in the F abstracts uh, proposal, are you proposing uh, from here on out, for going forward, that we try to formalize the statements and even definitions of current and new mathematics, or also a more ambitious project related to our discussions yesterday would be to go back and formalize the um, existing body of mathematical theorems and definitions. What, the F abstracts project specifically, which of those goals is, do you think, uh, part of that project? Thank well, you know, we're, we're not going to get everything. I mean, mathematics is growing too rapidly uh, for that, but, uh, I, you know, like here I'm, I'm starting with big conjectures, let's start with big theorems and uh, move in the direction of less consequence. That's neither new nor old, but uh, kind of uh, from the hardest problems uh, down the Okay, uh, Tobias. Yes, Nipko from Munich. Um, well, of course, the F abstracts uh, project raises the thorny question of what is the language and logic going to be that you formulate things in? Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you, you did say you're not going to ask, answer open questions. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, my proposal is lean, uh, I'm based in. Pittsburgh and uh, a lot of development going on there with Lean. Uh, I've used whole light in the past, but uh, to uh, I don't think it's really suited for. It's very good for real analysis, sphere packing, the type of things I've done, um, but uh, foundations are a little bit weak. What about set theory? I've, I've, I've thought about set theory, but uh, it, it's, it's tempting. My name is Greg Dijk from the Netherlands. Um, so to re react to Tobias, Tobias, I would like to see it as some kind of competition between various systems and see what turns out nicest. That's, that's my angle. Uh, my question is, once you get one of those formal abstracts, what are you going to do with it? Um, uh, so this is part of the initiatives of this nonprofit, I am KT, was just uh, uh, set up to manage uh, 
mathematical assets. Um, I mean, this will just be released uh, on the web under uh, liberal license for anybody to use it in any way uh, they want to use it, whether uh, data mining purposes or, or mathematicians looking up definitions or as a research tool or whatever. So Tom, I have a question actually. Uh, you know, looking back on the FlySpec project, uh, you know, uh, are there any uh, lessons learned that you'd like to share with us? Anything you might have done? Um, do it all in one proof of system. <laughs> <laughs> one piece of advice. Uh, uh, you know, it was very valuable early on to have uh, the contributions uh, in Isabel. Those were the first parts that were completed. Uh, but it turned out to be a minor nightmare to uh, reconcile. So in the end, we left, there was one statement uh, that was done in Isabel that needed to be imported into Holite. And uh, they're just slightly different conventions in the two systems that made it a bit of a nightmare to reconcile everything to get one coherent theorem in the end. So that's, that's one piece of advice. <coughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. Hello, Charlie. So outside of research mathematics um, in industry, uh, one of the, the tasks of formalization is to take imprecise regulatory requirements and to formalize them. So the Yang-Mills problem here is a very standard problem in industry. Do you know of anyone doing anything particularly creative with that? I mean, my understanding is that at this point, the best you do is you translate it and then you discuss with the regulator whether your translation meets their requirements. Um. So I don't know specifically, but uh, the experts are here. So yeah, but I think you know that's a, that's a, that's a uh, so the question is in uh, you know formalizing informal requirements. You know you run into the same problem, and uh, I think I mean the the connection you made to uh, Lakatos. I think there's a you know, similar dialectical process about maybe uh, arriving at uh, formal statements of these terms as well. There's going to be counterexamples and. Uh, you know, new definitions of responding to those. <coughs> Wait, uh, let's see. Uh, I think Fanner has a question, and then. Uh, um, I'm Fanner Tankov. Uh, I thought my question is also about the Lakatosh, because uh, uh, he's clearly on the money with some things, as you give the examples of the proofs and counterexamples and things like that. But when you read proofs and reputations, there's also this strong skepticism about formalization, especially that the introduction is like against the dogmatists of mathematics and things like this. And I, I guess w what I'm wondering is whether you see what you're doing with the formalization as kind of suggesting that Lakatosh is wrong about some of those skeptical uh, aspects. So I'll just go back to my first slide. Keep your conjectures bold and your refutations brutal. <laughs> There's a hand up at the back, yeah. That's Adam Frekiewicz from Glasgow University. I wanted to ask, what do you think is uh, the right venue for, for your project, for the formal abstracts? Should it be a GitHub repository or a journal submissions? Yeah, I, I think we'll just put everything on GitHub. You got a project yet? No, no. And uh, we're going to the... You um, didn't hear you say it, but I guess you mean that this formal abstracts, all of them should be based on the same foundation. It's not as if you want to uh, define this abstract and that abstract. They should have the same uh, underlying de definitions, which would be you know, number theory and analysis. It should all be built up in, in a single way. Is, is that what you have in the mind? Um, yes, I, I think uh, uh, we'll pick one foundational system, like the uh, calculus of inductive constructions in Lean, build everything up from there. And uh, if uh, people want to translate, then people can translate. 
first. So it's the second time you mentioned Lean, um, which I played with a bit, but it's a very new system. Is there some reason for uh, choosing that? that, that? Um, constructive, uh, int int intentional, but this is a, maybe not a standard choice. Um, so we would use classical logic. Uh, so um, it's it's a new system, and that uh, uh, has its problems. Thing, things are still experimental. Things are, are changing and developing quite rapidly. Uh, so that might be a bit of a difficulty. Okay, one last question, Peter. Uh, Peter Lepney-Lumpton. Uh, one, uh, one of the things that we saw um, from your example of the Kelvin conjecture was how even stating something precisely can already depend on a hard theorem. So wouldn't this make a danger that sort of formalizing abstracts would become as hard a problem as formalizing all the theorems themselves? Well, if... You know, if if we can't formalize Yang Mills, then we won't formalize Yang Mills. I mean, we'll, we'll we'll just do what we can do. Okay. So one last question, the gentleman on the back. Yeah. Uh, uh, Institute of Mathematical Sciences, uh, One question I had is, what kind of interest do you see among mathematicians in like experimentally done sense, like just you mentioned about census of tilings, this is like census of, for instance, like hyperbolic manifolds. Like which are experimentally carried out. I'm, I'm mean, sorry, I'm having a hard time hearing. So, well, there are various kinds of census problems in math which are experimentally carried out. For instance, hyperbolic uh, manifolds, three manifolds, and stuff like that. Uh, so, do you really see like an interest in the mathematical community in actually experiment? I mean, informally verifying these experimental results. Oh, uh, so the question, as I understand it, is there, is whether there's interest in the mathematical community. In verifying, formalizing, formalizing experimental, experimental mathematics. mathematics. Uh, uh, my impression is that that would be uh, difficult to do, but uh, if uh, there, there are ideas about how to carry that out, I think they would be welcome. But I don't know anything specific. Yeah, I just mentioned, like, uh, the case of hyperbolic manifolds, for instance. Yeah. Done by this thing called Snappa, I just think. But uh, like, there's been no formalization in these aspects. And, uh, okay, so uh, let's thank Professor Thompson.